Hey everyone, uh, everyone please take a seat. So welcome to our first official Friday Hacks of this semester. Uh, we are really excited for tonight's speaker, who is none other than Mr. Evan Yeo, sitting at the front here. So I, I think many of us know Evan as the creator of Vue.js and also his more recent project, which is Vite. So here's tonight's event outline. Uh, we'll first start off with a talk by Evan. And afterwards, we will break out into a hangout session where we can just mingle around this area and get some food uh, from outside. So we are really glad he's able to join us in person today. Uh, let's kick it off. Uh, Evan, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, so, yeah, I haven't been to a university campus since how long? Like, very long time. Anyway, uh, most of my talks are, you know, in professional settings. And it's just, um, yeah, I, I'm just really happy to be able to be back in a school setting and mingle with uh, students, especially since I'm kind of new in Singapore. So it's also great to meet local people. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> the talk today is uh, the journey of an indie OSS developer, which I am. Uh, oh, wait, this is, um, yeah, I need to switch to my slides. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, so um, so my name is Evan Yeo, and I'm originally from China, and I went to US for college. Uh, stay there for 16 years and just recently moved to Singapore. Uh, I've been an independent open source developer since 2016. So that's a bit of six years of being completely independent, moved to Singapore last year. And I work full time on open source projects, mostly Vue and Vite, which I'll talk about in a bit. And before that, uh, I was, before going full-time open source, I was working at a startup called Meteor, uh, which is based in Silicon Valley, but I worked remotely for them back in New Jersey. Uh, and before that I went, uh, I was at, working at Google in New York City. So things I work on, um, so Vue is a front-end JavaScript framework. So I'm doing a poll who has used Vue here, raise your hand. Ooh, quite a lot. Who have not used it, but at least heard about it? Great. So how about Vite? Who, who have used Vite? Well, quite a lot, quite a lot. <clears throat> so um, still quite a lot of you don't know what a Vite is probably. So, um, so first about Vue. Uh, Vue is actually the most starred GitHub source code project right now. So um, by source code project, I mean, if you exclude those repos that's are, that are mostly markdown files, like sharing books or links to other stuff. Uh, so if it contains open source, Vue is actually the most starred GitHub repo right now. Um, we have over 13 million plus of NPN downloads per month, 1.8 million weekly active users. So uh, this slide was just taken from an enterprise talk I was giving. So I need to give them numbers to show that it's actually serious stuff. But um, I don't, I don't really brag about this that much. Um, for those of you who don't know Vue or haven't used Vue before, here's just like a super quick, simple rundown. Um, so you can declare a reactive state. Now this is uh, Vue 3 API. If you've only used Vue 2, this may actually look new to you, but the very core idea about Vue is that you can have reactive state. What do you mean by reactive? So, right, we just declare some state with account property. Now we can write templates that's referencing those reactive stuff. So in here we are using count with an inter the double curly braces interpolation. We also have a click event handler. So that's just a, some syntax trigger that lets you say, when this button is clicked, increment the count. And when you do that, uh, the count is, which is actually rendered and showed to the user will automatically update. So we didn't have to write anything to touch the DOM or like, like jQuery or stuff like that, right? You just declaratively uh, connected everything and it will just work. So that's the core idea. And then you take these pieces, call it a component. Then you build a lot of components, then nest them together. Then you have an application. So that's 
the, in a nutshell, that's how we build most web UIs nowadays, right? If uh, this con these concepts actually kind of translate into other frameworks as well. If you've used React or Angular or Svelte, right? You know what I'm talking about. And uh, this is sort of a shared basic concept across modern front end now. Um, <clears throat> so the origin of Vue, uh, I started working on it as a side project when I was still working at Google in 2013. Um, and the, the very first version of Vue was inspired by AngularJS. So AngularJS, that's the old AngularJS, which is different from the Angular today. Um, the nice thing about it back then was you can include AngularJS with a script tag without installing Node.js and a bajillion of Node modules, and it would just work directly in the browser. And to this day, Vue actually still supports to be supports being used that way. So if you don't want to like uh, juggle with a lot of node tools, you can actually use Vue without any build step. Just script tag from a CDN and it will still work. Um, so the initial design goal was really to build something super simple, right? There are things I liked about AngularJS, uh, the reactive state and uh, reactive data binding in templates. It's really nice uh, because before that, I was building a lot of things that's just using manual JavaScript jQuery, selecting stuff. And it was, uh, I would say when you build something complex with jQuery, it just becomes what we call it jQuery spaghetti and becomes really hard to maintain. So having something reactive and declarative is super important. But AngularJS brought in a lot of backend concepts like modules, services, dependency injection, which for me back then were just like buzzwords. I don't care about them. I just want Reactive data binding, that's it. So I'm like, okay, let me build this small library my, for myself that only implement the things I care about and maybe using a, a better implementation internally. Um, so back then we still, a lot of frameworks still need to support IE6. Who have worked with, had to support IE6 here? I don't think any of you, any of you here actually do, right? Uh, so that, that was the requirement back then. And uh, IE6 did not did not even support ES5, aka ECMAScript 5. So that it's like the like the previous baseline for like modern JavaScript. Now the baseline is ES2015, but like before that was ES5. So in 2013, ES5 wasn't even universally supported. If you ship a library and tell people say it only supports ES5 and above, people will be like, I'm not going to use it. Um, so Vue was created around that time. And I was like, I don't care. Nobody's going to use this anyway. So I'm just going to use ES5 as much as I want since most of our projects only uh, our internal projects, Google, and they only need to work in Chrome. And Chrome was like supporting everything already. So, so that basically allowed me to just use whatever the latest features in JavaScript language and just play with it. And uh, that was the, the initial... Um, process for me, right? It was super scrappy, just the side projects, mostly experimentational and really just scratching my own itch because um, I want to build something for myself that I would use in my day-to-day -day work. Uh, so for a very long time, it remained a side project. So um, the first commit was, was in June, 2013. And then the public first public release was in February, 2014. So that's like a very long time because I, didn't spend all my time working on it. It was just like on and off on weekends. I would like, let's work on this a few hours. And uh, eventually in February, I, I got it to a state where I felt like, okay, this is actually usable now. So let's write some documentation, make a website, post it on Hacker News. And uh, actually got 54 upvotes, got on the front page. So uh, People actually start to notice it. And then we got like a few hundred GitHub stars, which is huge back then. Um, and, and then I work, kept working on Vue as a side project uh, after I left Google to join Meteor as a the side project. So uh, interesting anecdote is um, uh, when I went to, when I talked with Meteor, I wasn't really in contact with them about joining them. So uh, we got in contact through some investor relationship and they were like, we're interested in your work about Vue. Can you come, we'll fly you in and you can give us a talk about the implementation. So I was like, cool, that's a good excuse to visit San Francisco. So I went there 
And um, I gave a talk and afterwards they just gave me an offer and say like, do you want to join us? I'm like, oh, interesting. Then I <laughs> went back and thought a few days and, and felt like, okay, uh, sounds like it's a good opportunity to try the Silicon Valley life. But after I joined, I actually just worked remotely in New Jersey and like didn't really got to be in the, in the heart of everything. Uh, but anyway, uh, in 2015, I used all my vacation days and released uh, 1.0 of UJS. Um, so this was actually a blog post uh, of the, the first week of the initial public release, that's February, 2014. It's still up there. So if people are interested, you can look it up. But uh, I was basically going over how I publicized the, the project as practically nobody. Um, so I posted to Hacker News, posted to some newsletters in the JavaScript ecosystem. So you have like things, back then there were uh, a website called DailyJS that would just um, tell you about new JavaScript library releases every day. Yes, there are that many new JavaScript libraries that you can talk about every single day. There are new libraries. Um, and uh, and after that, uh, we start to, so, so, so I've been talking about the initial phase, right? So now we need to kind of zoom out a bit into the big picture and think about the technology adoption cycle. Obviously, we've view has come a long way to, to where it is today, but we didn't just get there like instantly. There is a process, right? So um so any so this this graph, this theory was taken from a book called Crossing the Chasm. Uh, it basically applies to any kind of new technology gener generically. So the idea is when you have a new technology that seems useful, a lot of people will get hyped about it. Like this is the future, right? And there will be a peak of inflated expectations. People will think this technology will be the hammer to solve everything. And we'll just throw everything at it, throw it at everything, makes everything better, right? And once you pass that phase, you start to realize, okay, maybe it's not that great, right? So I think, for example, uh, like GraphQL, when GraphQL first came out, people are like, this is the future. It's going to completely replace REST. And uh, well, it didn't. Uh, it, it's got some use cases, but it's like, it's not a replacement for REST. Um, so, so for Vue, um, we were at this sort of, peak of inflated expectations for a while. But but um, Vue really isn't, uh, I would say open source technology really isn't that big in terms like it doesn't produce the scale of affecting of things like say nuclear power or steam engine or stuff like that. Uh, so I like to translate this into my personal progress of working on a project, right? So I was first getting into open source and there was a peak of excitement and output. That was when I was maybe taking the vacations. I took like 20 days of vacation and just spent them all working on my open source project. I didn't go anywhere, didn't travel and like work 12 hours a day. Uh, that was the peak of excitement and output. But, um, and you'll be in that state for a while. What, like if you wanna work on open source, and you find a really exciting idea you want to work on, you'll go through this phase. You'll be like, I can just keep working on this all day and I'll feel tired because I'm just, I believe this is going to be the thing that's going to blow up. And maybe it does blow up. You'll get a few hundred stars on GitHub and you'll be over the moon and you'll be like, okay, let's build this thing into a huge community and we're going to like go to conferences and talk about it. But uh, in a lot of cases, this doesn't happen immediately, right? For me, uh, after Vue released, uh, the the reality is I started receiving bug reports. And bug reports are really like so crushing if you are not prepared for it because every morning you wake up, there's some random people on the internet telling you, hey, you just your code just broke and you need to fix it. And every day it's, dif it's different people telling you different bugs and it never stops. You know, um, so so after a few weeks, I'm like, I'm not sure if I signed up for this. Um, and there was a, you know, so this is so-called burnout phase. You start to question like whether it's actually worth it to keep working like 12 days, 12 hours a day on this thing. Like you're seemingly just like, sometimes you will really feel like 
Um, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to cuss here, but you feel like crap um, because you feel like, okay, like I shipped this code that's being used by hundreds and thousands of people and it's causing bugs in their code base and, and I'm like causing them trouble, right? So you, you go into self-doubt um, and, and you see like on my GitHub graph, if you look at my contribution graph, there are these moments there are these, actually, it's not just a moment, it's a period where I completely just lose confidence in the stuff I write. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Uh, so, so this is basically, I stopped writing open source code and just like focused on my day job and not really like looking at Vue at all um, back in 2014 and 15. So I still had a full-time job, right? So I can just like say, I'm going to do my full-time job and I'm going to think about open source ever again. Uh, they're not paying me money anyway. And um, so this is the chasm. So for, for your projects to really stand the test of time and overcome all those initial bugs, because like when you're fixing bugs, sometimes you even run into even more, I don't know, like more demoralizing moments. You realize, okay, maybe this architecture that I laid out initially was just wrong. I need to rewrite everything now. Um, so so you, you go through this chasm where you're just like, it, can I ever get out of it, right? Uh, and for products too, right? A lot of products, new technology, once they go into this phase, it, it can just tanks so much, it just never get out of it. Actually, 90% of startups die in this phase. Um, and 90% of open source projects stop here. People start realizing, okay, I need to fix bugs for people for free, and they just stop doing it. Um, so if you push through, though, if you push through, though, there will be, a, a, like, if you just put enough heart into it, maybe you can push through it. And um, for me personally, the things I did, I realized was that I need to, I need to start setting boundaries as a maintainer, right? So the reason I was burned out was because I realized, okay, I'm taking these bug reports way too seriously. It's like I'm on call, on call 24 seven, every single day when a bug report come in, right? I had GitHub push notifications on my phone and I was like, okay, someone had a bug. I need to jump to the computer and fix it now, right? And that just completely destroys your work-life balance because now you're basically, there's no life anymore. It's just all work. You're only working for your project and you're not really doing anything else because once your project gets, enough, popular enough, the reports will never stop coming. So you're essentially forever tied to it. So the only way to uh, get out of this, you know, cycle is to, to actually set a boundary and reclaim the part of your life that it should belong to yourself. So for me, the first thing I did was I want to automate as much as possible. I realized I spent a lot of time, waste a lot of time actually trying to ask people very basic questions in issues. Like some people would come up with just a question. Obviously, they didn't read the docs. Obviously, they didn't uh, even bother to, to figure out what they were actually doing wrong. They just said, okay, this is not working. You help me fix it, right? This kind of issues. Uh, so I started using an automated issue form that uh, basically if you don't fill on the form as it required, it would close it. I'd started doing this back in 2016. I think GitHub just recently implemented this, this feature natively like last year. <laughs> So I had to use my custom solution for five years before they actually did it for other maintainers. Um, the second one is I turned off push notifications. Um, so now it's basically like saying to your boss at work, like, don't call me after work, right? Which is totally reasonable as an employee. So I'm, so I'm working for myself since 2016. So in order for me to actually have a, work-life balance, I just turn off push notifications and use poll instead. By poll, I mean every morning at a fixed time, I would look at issues and decide whether I want to, what I want to do with them. And after a fixed amount of time, I'm like, okay, I'm done for the day. I'm just going to focus on more creative work instead of dealing with issues so that I can actually have some energy for real stuff. Um, and yeah, and work-life balance is impor important even if you're doing a full-time open source. So Interestingly, this is uh, like a full graph since 2015. And uh, I noticed from the graph, I can actually relate to a lot of important events in my life. Uh, the green grids 
every green grid represents a day where I actually pushed some commits to GitHub. And um, so this really dense grid uh, are the days I probably pushed like 20, 30 plus commits in a day. Um, and this is when I started working full time at open source here. Uh, and this is the start of develop, development of Vue 2, which is a complete rewrite of Vue from the ground up. Um, and we released Vue 1, I think in October. So I took a week off. And then uh, next year, I took a very long vacation back in, back in China. Uh, didn't work much. My excuse was um, I need a VPN and it was the, the internet connection was really bad. I'm like, no, I'm going to look at, I can't even open GitHub. I'm not going to answer issues. Uh, yeah, and uh, this is when I moved to a new house. So unpacking and doing that, like setting up the new house took a lot of time. So I just like took a few weeks off. Then my daughter was born. And, um, and here, like in 2019, I had a really big burnout. Uh, I was... I was losing motivation for a bit because Vue 2 has been released for over a year and a half. And it's really just fixing bugs every day uh, and occasionally shipping some new issues, uh, new features. And uh, at this moment, I was feeling like, okay, I really need some change in the pace because I felt I was working too hard. So I took a long sabbatical. And, and that's the great thing about about this is uh, I intentionally set up the whole financial situation to be as passive as possible. Uh, that's also a lifestyle choice, right? Uh, actually, people have asked me, why don't you take some VC money and start a company? And then for me, uh, since day one, I've been focusing on making it sustainable by generating passive income from open source. So we have sponsorships, ads, we collaborate with educational content partners, uh, to help them uh, with affiliation links and stuff. So all of these, um, I don't do any contracts. I don't do any consulting. Um, the reason is when I do like support contracts or consulting, I'm essentially trading my time for money and I'm not actually working on the project, the open source project that I care about. What I want to be able to do is for the work I'm doing to be things I'm generally passionate about. I want to work on Vue. I want to work on Vite. I want to just focus on the technology itself. Um, obviously, I need to think about monetization. Otherwise, I would, wouldn't be able to live. But well, I want the monetization. Once I set it up, I want it to be as passive as possible so that I don't have to say, I need to work eight hours today in order to get this bill paid. I don't have to do that. Uh, once you have a passive income flow, you kind of get a lot more flexibility in managing your time and dealing with your burnout, which is inevitable as an open source developer. So I took that freedom and essentially took almost four to five months off in 2019. Uh, I wrote a little bit code this month because this is when I visited Singapore for the first time. I had a conference talk. So I'm like, I need something that I can talk about. So I worked on some new features and prepared a talk for that. Then I went back and I uh, went back into sabbatical. And eventually this long rest turned into something good because I had started having new ideas. When you stop working on some, when you keep working on something every single day, you kind of lose context of things. You focus on these small things you're trying to fix every single day, but you kind of lose sight of the big picture. So taking the long break allowed me to kind of zoom back and think about, okay, like what, what's the future like for front end in like five years? What should I do now, start working on now? So this is when I started working on Vue 3, uh, which is again, a complete rewrite. And, and you see the productivity kind of jumped back a little bit. There are some deep grids here. And, and then 2020 had an, another great new idea and started working on Vite. Uh, so, so surprisingly, Vite at this point, this was actually the burnout phase for V3. <laughs> and I worked on Vite as an escape. So I can stop thinking about V3 because V3 was kind of running into some hard problems. I was, I was, I had initial prototypes, did research, but there was there were challenges that I was like, okay, this is not good enough. 
And then I work, started working on Vite as sort of like side project. Um, and it turned into yet another thing. Um, so you see a pattern here. Like I get bored at work, at the real work, then I work on side projects, then I start something interesting. Um, yeah, and uh, so last year there were a few COVID lockdown burnouts and then I moved to Singapore, uh, trying to look for houses, get kids into school and all that. So uh, again, and then it's now. So the leap of faith in 2016, was I started working on Vue full-time via Patreon. Uh, GitHub Sponsors wasn't even a thing back then. Uh, we've mostly moved to GitHub Sponsors now, which is great. Um, completely rewrote Vue for 2.0 and released it in September, 2016. And this, this is what I talked about passive income, right? So we have uh, Patreon, GitHub Sponsors, Open Collective, Education Content Partners, ads, and I even automated the whole sponsor onboarding process. So if you like sign up for GitHub sponsors, we send you automated email, giving you a form, you fit it out and our GitHub actions automatically send a pull request to the docs and it just like your logo is up there. I don't even need to talk to them. Uh, people just sign up and I get money, which is great. <clears throat> uh, and then I realized, okay, I can't keep doing this alone forever, right? I need a team. Uh, so in order for to, the great thing about open source is you get a lot of users and you form a community and people start contributing. And so the team formation was really organic because there are naturally really passionate people about your project. Um, but I don't want to give people hard responsibilities. I hate being a manager. I hate running companies, which is I don't start one. Um, but running an open source team is kind of a different thing. So we run it really, really loosely. We don't have any hard responsibilities. All the team members build trust over long time collaboration and uh, contributions come in all forms, not just code. A uh, very important thing about open source is uh, not only code contributions are considered contributions. For example, we have a team member who never contributed a single line of code before we made him team member. And the only thing he did was on staying on the view forums and keep answering people's questions. He answered so many questions. And just from those answers, I can see he actually understands a lot better than some people who have actually committed code. So, which is super interesting. So I invited him and he's been with us ever since. Um, so another aspect of it is, uh, like this is just basically experience I, I kind of took notes for myself is to give capable people autonomy and ownership. Um, occasionally there will be people who submit a lot of PRs that really aligns with my philosophy or my initial idea of how this should work. And I realized, okay, like this kind of people are really helpful. And sometimes uh, when you are just a single developer, you will feel really protective of your code. You'll be like, I don't want anyone else to be able to change it. But eventually, um, you'll find people who actually, like, they, they would continuously align with your thoughts. And you trust them so much that you give them commit access. You allow them to merge PRs. You allow them to even ship new features and make releases. And at that point, you start actually to scale beyond a single person project. And it becomes a team, a community. Um, so growing the community, um, mostly it's, actually, it's, it's online. So, uh, Twitter, discord, um, but initially it was online, but then we started having people who approached me saying, we want to host view meetups locally. We want to actually view, host view conferences. So, uh, before COVID hit, we had maybe four to five conferences every year around the globe in Amsterdam, Tokyo, China, uh, and in, uh, in Europe. In, we, had, we had ones in Poland, in Italy, uh, a lot of places. And the first one, in fact, was in Poland in a small city called Wrocław. Anyone have heard of it? No, it's a beautiful city. Uh, so if you ever travel to Poland, you can visit it, but that was, the location of the first few conferences, a city very few people have actually heard about. And we had like 400 people from across Europe traveling to that city for the conference. And I was there and I was completely shocked because I didn't really like believe it could actually happen. So when the 
the company was based in that city hosting the conference. And then when they approached me, I was like, I don't know if this is gonna work, but I trust you guys. So, and it went ahead and it was a success. And then because of that, a lot of these other uh, conference hosting partners in other parts of the world got a lot more confidence because they're saying, okay, if you can make this work in Vrasrov, we can definitely make it work elsewhere. <laughs> So uh, yeah, so we have uh, in the biggest one in Amsterdam, we had over uh, 1300 people uh, in one room. So, which was crazy for me. Um, so obviously when you have a big community, when you have so many users, there will be challenges. Uh, we have, the, the problem with a huge community is you have a very bad signal noise ratio. Um, much more to consider and convince when you're trying to ship in significant changes. So this is not a problem in your early phase of project because you can say, I'm just gonna ship a breaking change tomorrow and nobody cares because I don't have users, it's easy. Now, once you have users, you start need to stick to things like semantic versioning. You can't just randomly break things. You have to uh, follow the rules about like version increments so people don't yell at you. Uh, if you ship a breaking change in a patch release, sure, you're going to get a lot of GitHub issues with angry people in the comments. Um, and uh, yeah, so with great power comes great responsibility, especially when you are trying to say, I want to ship some really big changes or big new additions that maybe even undermines the original philosophy of the framework. Some people will get really angry and they'll be like, okay, don't touch what's working. Just, just stop working on new stuff. Uh, they wanna keep using it forever and not having to ever change. So um, yeah, so you run into situations like that, but at the same time as a creator, you also feel the pressure of, okay, like I don't want it to become stagnant. I want to keep working on new stuff. I wanna keep improving it or trying new ideas. So uh, it's a constant struggle between these modes. Um, so V in some way was by outlet because in the initial phase of V3, we had some RFCs proposals that met some strong resistance from the community. And I was essentially debating with people all day, uh, not writing much code and it got into burnout mode. I was like, okay, I wanna experience that early phase again. I want to go back to starting a new project and just being able to crank out breaking changes every day. Uh, so V2 was, an experiment in April, 2020 and uh, and I worked on it and completely just like throwing V3 on the side and which is why V3 took so, so long. Uh, and, and then uh, V2 was close to 1.0 when I realized, okay, like there are some fundamental change of direction. And I realized its potential because initially I created it only for Vue. I was like, okay, I want a faster, development setup for Vue than Webpack. Uh, after it's close to completion, I realized, okay, most of the stuff I built for it actually works for any framework. Why not just make it framework agnostic? And that's what I did, which is why Vue 1.0 never came because I just ditched the Vue specific parts and refactored into a whole new branch that works with all frameworks and then moved all the Vue specific logic into plugins. And in that process also designed the plugin API. And I realized it needs to be compatible with Rollup to get some initial adoption help. So uh, 2.0 released in February, 2021, and it proved to be quite successful so far. So it just recently crossed 1.5 million downloads a week on NPM. And uh, 3.0 just released, uh, th not this week. So this slide is kind of outdated, but, um, and the great thing is, great thing about Vite today, um, so before I talk about what it is, is I'm super proud that I made Vite a team much earlier than I did with Vue. Uh, ever, ever since I started release 2.0, I, I asked people to, um, to join the team and help share the burden and maintenance. And luckily we got some really, really passionate and talented people. And I was able to actually almost delegate most of the daily maintenance to the team now, and mostly focus on uh, high level directions, uh, trying to unblock things for them. And because Vite got a lot of buy-in 
because it's cross framework, it actually got buying from different frameworks, different teams. And um, we have people being hired by some of the companies betting on Vite to have them work full time on Vite, which is super great. Um, so, so going back a little bit, if you don't know what Vite is, uh, so how many of you know what Webpack is? Webpack, Webpack, okay. So if you don't know what Webpack is, it's, it's basically nowadays when you write front end code, you actually need a compiler. You need a compiler to build your stuff so, so all your modules can be bundled together more efficiently to run. Uh, and then there are nice things like uh, if you change line of code, you wanna see it instantly change without reloading the page. That's called hot module replacement. Uh, so you need some tools for that kind of fancy stuff. And Vite is essentially a, uh, a replacement of an existing stack, but makes the whole process maybe five to 10 times faster. So make your whole development experience five to 10 times better. Um, <clears throat> so going framework agnostic was the right choice. Uh, we made it framework agnostic, got a lot of buying. So now it's Vite is slowly shaping into the foundation of a cross framework ecosystem. Uh, many React users actually use it. Uh, funny enough, uh, initially people were like, nobody, no React user is ever gonna use it because it's created by the author of Vue. And look what's happening now. Uh, uh, Vue 3 tooling obviously defaults to Vite now. SvelteKit is built on Vite. Astro, Solid, Quick, Shopify, Hydrogen, a lot of these buzzed next-gen frameworks are all built on Vite. So Vite is essentially the infrastructure layer for these next-gen stuff, which is super exciting. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, so finally, closing the so thoughts on uh, Indie OSS versus Big Corp OSS. Right? We know open source is not just Indie developers, they are like React, which is backed by a mega core, Angular backed by a mega corp. Um, the difference is that we were grassroots. We had completely organic growth. We had no big company backing. So people, the only way people learned about Vue and adopted Vue is by actually hearing it from other people, seeing it somewhere on the internet, trying it out themselves, actually believe it was good and then use it, right? It's not like in a big company, people were like, we'll go with React because everyone else is using it. And it's gonna be fired for using React just like, Nobody's gonna be fired for choosing IBM, but that's not a really you know, good thought process. So, so the thing I'm proud about is I can say most people who are using Vue actually made that decision by thinking about it, right? Um, and community is key. Uh, indie projects couldn't be this big without a lovely community. And you need to, sometimes you need to do things to make sure the community has a good vibe. So people are willing to actually participate, that's important. Um, and there's different measurement of impact. In fact, for me personally, I stopped caring about GitHub stars. I stopped caring about NPM downloads. Um, for me, like the things I mostly care about is uh, how many users can I make happy, right? Uh, if we can make users happy, then I'm happy. Uh, compared to, Open source at big companies, usually it's kind of a distorted incentive because big corp open source is either a way to sell their product or to help recruitment, make it easier to hire people and save training costs. So uh, a for-profit company never open sources something just for the goodwill of it. They're either brand building their brand image or trying to get something in return. Otherwise the management would be like, why are we spend like 3 million a year on this thing that doesn't give us any money back? Does it make sense, right? Um, and finally, for me, it's a lifestyle choice. Uh, it gives me a lot of freedom, being able to control my work-life balance and move to any part of the world because I work completely remotely and I make money the same way anywhere I live. So, which is why I'm able to be here and talk to you guys. So thank you, that's it. Uh, would you like, would you like yeah, I, can, I can answer questions too. Okay, uh, does anyone have questions for Evan? He's willing to take some. Um, yes. 
Uh, um, so view is the French word for view. So V I E W. So I put it into Google Translate, saw the word French word. I was like, this looks cool. Three letters and available on NPM. Let's grab it. Right? Nowadays, you can't find any package with three letters anymore. So uh, Vite is similar. Vite is also a French word, um, which is why it's pronounced Vite. A lot of people pronounce it Vite, but it's actually Vite because it's the French word for quick. And I built it to give you a fast, quick development server, which is why it's called Vite. Oh, yeah. No, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering how did the evolution of like other frameworks like React and Angular have an impact on your journey? Because I imagine mm -hmm. like Angular came out in 2016 mm -hmm. and React keeps like sending out incremental changes that I don't recognize the syntax every two years, right? So how did that impact you, if any, at all? Uh, definitely a lot of, um, so there's a lot of initial influence from Angular version one. So ever since Angular two, we didn't really pay too much attention because it kind of default, like evolved into whole its own enterprisey C sharp like flavor, um, and we kind of want to focus back on the simple stuff. And uh, React still have important influence in some views. So for version two, we shipped virtual DOM and server side rendering support, which was first found in React. And then we also, in V3, we have Composition API, which is partly inspired by React hooks. Uh, it kind of provides the same level of logic composition patterns that React hooks enables. So there's definitely a lot of influence. Um, I would say there's a lot of cross influence between these frameworks as well, like uh, Vue's reactivity system uh, so technically kind of inherits from Knockout back in 2009 and uh, you're now seeing new flavors like SolidJS, which is actually getting a lot of popularity in the React world, but SolidJS's reactivity system is actually almost the same as Views. Um, and then Svelte has the single file components that's very similar to Vue. Um, so the, we are also like, no, so Vue is also kind of learning from these new frameworks like Svelte. We're trying to see how we can maybe make some syntax even simpler. We're also learning from Solid to see how we can improve our compiler to make the runtime performance better. So um, th that's the great thing about open source is um, everything is open source and usually it's in very permissive licenses. So you can learn from each other. You can take good ideas from other frameworks to improve your own. And we kind of step on each other's shoulders. So eventually the, the end user benefits because the competition creates better software. Thank you. Uh, uh, hi, Evan. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm just like want to continue the similar discussion. Like, <clears throat> I mean, I've never been an open source developer, but I just wanted to know your perspective on like, like, I know, like something like, <clears throat> does this like frameworks, like let's say React Angular, like do you have like, maybe some kind of feeling like, oh, like, you know, uh, you need to be, you need to be bigger than them. Otherwise my income gets threatened or something like that. I know. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes there will be pressure. Like you obviously, I don't want Vue to die. Otherwise, I would be out of money. <laughs> but but, uh, uh, but a lot of times, it's it's not about uh, it's it's less like com pure business competition where every single company wants to completely dominate the market. So our goal is not to dominate the market because we realize, I think, for a few phases, there were a few phases or moments, I was like, I want to just beat them. But uh, I also realized like web development is super a super big tent. Uh, there are developers coming from different backends. They all kind of have more or less touch a little bit of front end, right? There are people who mostly work on back end. And occasionally they need to do front end. There are people who primarily work with Java or C Sharp. And when they do front end, I realize, okay, they obviously, they're going to like Angular because it feels so similar to them. All the concepts, all the syntax, it's just like they're at home. And there's no point for me to compete with Angular to get those users. It would only distort Vue itself and turn it into something that's like not good for anyone. Right? So you can't please everyone. So it's important to um, understand like who the who your users are, but at the same time, you know, it's also a tough balance because you only focus on your users, you'll stagnate, and uh, sometimes your user base just stays the same. 
So like, for example, Vue initially was created for simple cases. So people, a lot of people were like, okay, you can't handle enterprise. You can't handle big scale. Uh, so we had to like support TypeScript. We had to uh, introduce patterns that allows you to better scale in, in large scale situ situations. Um, and these paid off. Now we have more enterprise users, but this also pissed off some entry-level users who are like, okay, why are you introducing these complicated things into your into a simple framework? Uh, well, the thing is we try to keep all the simple things unchanged. So the simple ways still work, but we still need to add additional things so that people with different needs can actually unlock those cases. So it's always a very challenging balance. Thank you for the answer. I don't want to take up all the time, so we can uh, stop if we have like time limits. Hi, uh, so what was your very first source of income related to Vue and how did it go by? The very first thought? Yeah, like uh, the revenue, like how, uh, the, the very first source of income. Income? Oh, yeah, income. related to Vue, yeah. Oh, uh, um, so the very first source of income, so I, I just, I saw Patreon, I saw someone else using Patreon, and the nice thing about Patreon is you set it up, people donate money, they, it's a subscription, they pay you every month, and you don't need to worry about it again. So it's like, this looks nice, I'll try it. Uh, and that's how, my, uh, that's how I got the first money. So I set up the profile and told people I'm working on Vue full-time now. So if you want to support me, you should. Um, and one of the biggest help in the initial phase was I have a friend who runs a company in China. Uh, they were also a startup back then, but they are the kind of startup that really loves to give back to open source. They were using Ruby on Rails, so they donated to Rails. Uh, they don't actually use Vue, they use React, but the CTO was a good friend of mine. And he was like, are you going to do it full time now? Like, oh, like we have this open source fund. We're just gonna support you for $3,000 a month for half a year. And so that you can get it off the ground. I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, that, that really helped as well. Yeah. Hey, Evan. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. I just have one question. So yes. a lot of us here are students and it's... Oh, sorry. Yeah, I can ask <laughs> You're blocked by a message. Yeah. Um, a lot of us here are students and... Um, Whenever I wanted to start with OSS development, I never did. It's like huge code bases you don't have context mm -hmm. for. And yeah, then yeah. you kind of get discouraged or yeah. intimidated to start. Uh, and I was wondering if you have any tips on how people can get into OSS dev. Uh, like Definitely. This is a question I get a lot from. So um, usually first look in the projects, all the markdown files to see if they've written anything. Like for example, for Vue, we have files like contributing.md that tries to give you a rundown of what the repo is about. Uh, I guess the first step is to read a lot of different repos, figure out the common patterns. Like for example, if you want to get into front end, you'll you probably see a lot of files. Maybe you, you don't even know what the file does. Then you search for the file, figure out what each file does in the root directory. Um, then when you're reading the code base, um, I think, honestly, like in the early days, pure JavaScript code bases were pretty hard to read. Nowadays, most TypeScript projects are actually easier to read, in my opinion. Uh, so the first thing you do, learn TypeScript, at least understand the basic syntax. Then when you read a TypeScript-based project, you can, whenever you see something, you can just jump to its definition and see where it was defined, how it should be used. And every function is more or less self-documenting. Um, and Another great way to figure out how a project work is by following the simplest use case. For example, the first thing they do in the tutorial, for example, in Vue, it would be you start a new application. What's going on? You see, I'm importing this function. Let me look for this function in the code base. Follow that function. What other function are it, is it calling? You just keep following this chain to try to figure out the, the thing together. Sometimes it helps to build a mind map using some so like software. Um, but that's usually the way I read code. 
uh, for me to read code mostly, it's like I run into a bug. I start debugging it directly from their build files. Now I'm like, this doesn't look right. I go to their repository on GitHub, I clone it, then I start looking their code and, um, yeah, so, so I think it's important to uh, start with the simplest possible case and then figure out how it's making that work. And you don't need to figure out everything all at once, but, uh, but once you do that, quite often, um, you slowly get a hand of it and building your own small library also helps. You don't need to build it with a purpose of making it popular or huge. The, the purpose is learning, like say, I want to build a version of say Lodash. Like, how does this function work? Let me try to write it myself. Uh, start with small things. Yeah. Hope that helps. Oh, yes. Uh, I noticed you name your versions with anime titles. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What gave you that idea and how do people react to it? Thank you. Um, I forgot how I came up with that idea. So when I released version 0.7, I, I noticed Node.js had like also like a version release names and Node.js is using the chemical table. Uh, so it's all like elements. So a, following the, the alphabetic order. So um, I randomly named version 0.7 Animatrix because it's a really, like I just watched it and it was really good. It's an animated series about matrix and um, and when I did the next version, I'm like, okay, I'm also going to do some sci-fi kind of themed thing, but then I realized, oh, maybe I can start doing it in alphabetic order. It'll be cool to have this sort of like an Easter egg. Yeah. So I kept doing it. Uh, one of the pity is originally there was a version reserved for F. Yes, yes which I never shipped because I shipped 2.0 and I was like, I don't want to work on what version one anymore. <laughs> so version, version code name F never came. So, but we keep doing all the other versions all the way. So the next release will be R. And, and there are people actually having a GitHub repo where they bet on the next version of these things, <laughs> so, which is funny, but also cool. Hey Evan, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious about more like your perspective, like from when you first started um, Vue. So I actually worked on a somewhat popular open source project. Mm -hmm. And I'm like curious, like how did you, um, because working on Vue, I'm sure it's not just um, coding all the time, right? You have mm -hmm. to do, I don't know, sales, maybe not sales, but like marketing and mm -hmm. support. Yep. How do you juggle your time between coding, um, uh, marketing, sales? Um, so interestingly, I think aside from the first week of release, I never do I never did any intentional marketing. Sometimes I write blog posts, but as you can see, like the view blog has like five articles. <laughs> and I basically write a blog article like three to four months in, in between. So I'm I'm really lazy in terms of that, but like I think what helped views adoption is I was active on Twitter, I was active on Zhuhu, which is the Chinese social network. Uh, and I, I did it mostly as a way to kill time. I was like, I just fixed a bug. I want to take a, take a break. So I'm just going to open Twitter to see what's going on. Um, and sometimes I just naturally got involved in the technical discussions or my tweets and that kind of, you know, uh, in some way, I, I think my personal, like, personality or branding sort of helped views adoption in some way because like when I was on Twitter, I'm just like, if there's some people talking about a front end technology problem and they're wrong, I have to correct them <laughs> and you know, not really correct them, but like I can help, but you know, just get involved and throw my two cents. And, and then after you keep doing it, I kind of start to build some sort of, you know, uh, personal influence and people started realizing, okay, this guy actually knows his stuff. Um, I think that's pretty much what would be the equivalent of marketing I did, but I never did it intentionally. It was just really me just being on Twitter and okay. sometimes I get into controversial stuff. <laughs> oh, I, I see. Um, I actually have another question, right? So, you, you know, you build a framework and people basically build on top of that. So you have to make decisions that really impact 
others, right? Like lots of people. So I'm curious, how do you make product decision, right? How do you mm -hmm. maybe balance between, you know, scratching our own itch, maybe being authentic versus yep. um, bending over to what like users want? It, yeah, this is definitely a hard question and there's no right answer to this. Um, so we started at, at the certain point, I think starting with V3, we started doing RFCs, which is request for comments. So RFCs is essentially me intentionally setting up a process that forces, I have to go through that process as well. Like everyone else, I even though I have the ability to say this RFC is going to be accepted, still we have to make the process open. So, because um, at, a, at a certain point, it's not just me making the decisions. When I have the intention to ship something, I need to first make people aware of it and then get feedback. Uh, Obviously, it's my job to listen to feedback and gauge whether it is reasonable feedback. Um, so there's still a lot of room there for you to sort of exercise your vision, but it's important to listen to what actual users are thinking or reacting. Um, sometimes, maybe a lot of people are, there could be, so there's no definitely wrong, no right or wrong way things about it because some like if all users are happy and you're happy, that's great. But most likely there will be some happy users and some not so happy users. And sometimes there will be really angry users, right? So, um, and it, it's, it, it has to be evaluated case by case to say, okay, does this angry person actually make sense? Like you, you sometimes have to control your own emotion because I can get emotional when I'm debating with someone and I feel like he's just being unreasonable. Uh, so there will be cases where you'll, you'll be like, okay, I get what you're saying. I just think you're wrong. So we're going to close this case. There, this could happen too. But in a lot of cases, there are a few cases where I was strongly intending to ship something and I eventually I realized, okay, like you actually raise a good point. I didn't realize this. And maybe we should rethink this. There, this happened a few times too. So it, it all comes down to you as the maintainer because um, most smaller open source projects, even Vue is actually considered small scale compared to things like Linux or Chromium, right? So in these projects, I still act as sort of like the BDFL rule where I have the final say of making decisions. So when you're in that role, it's important for you to be honest with yourself. You don't want to your want your ego to get in the way and say, this is my decision and I'm gonna just make it. Um, you have to be just honestly reviewing, like, am I actually doing this from a pure technical standpoint? If I believe I'm doing that, then yeah, even sometimes people disagree with me, I'll push it through. But yeah, ultimately it's like, you just need to be honest with yourself. I see, thanks Evan. Yeah, uh, we do have some questions from Zoom. Um, cool. Yeah, so what are your thoughts about Vue 3 adoption? <clears throat> so Vue 3 is an interesting story because um, when we first shipped to Vue 3, as I said, I did spend a lot of time on Vue, which is why we dragged on the Vue, uh, Vue 3 like release process for a long time. So when we released it, it was more of, um, let's get the stable version out. And the initial plan was to do a slow rollout. So the ver stable version was out. We want early adopters to start using it and transition to it. Then uh, we want to polish the documentation, polish the other tool chains. We want to polish say like script setup syntax. So like to be completely honest, only the version 3.2 of Vue was actually the like a full embodied version of Vue 3 uh, with everything ready. So. It was only until February this year, we finally shipped the new documentation. So now we have a whole set of new, like including Vite going stable, right? So now we have new Vite based tool chain, a brand new, much more performant and complete TypeScript support, IDE, command line, everything um, have brand new documentation. We wrote almost all the chapters, a lot of new content. Um, and script setup syntax finally made some people like like composition API. So um, it's actually a pretty challenging and long process. Um, so ever since we shipped the new docs today, we are seeing like three X adoption in like four months time uh, for V3. So that percentage is growing very rapidly. And uh, so by the end of year, I think that's probably gonna 
V2 is still going to have a lot of staying usage because there are a lot of old use cases where people simply don't have any motivation like motive to upgrade. So for them, we actually ship 2.7. We're like, okay, if you don't want to upgrade, don't, but we're going to give you some good things that we shipped in Vue 3 and you can stay on Vue 2 if you want to. Um, so I think most users should be happy at this point. Uh, I think there were definitely a period of time where some users were grumpy because they were stuck in a state where they want to upgrade, but couldn't. And they want the new APIs, but they couldn't use it. So fortunately, I think uh, as of today, we essentially solved all of those problems. How is your typical day like? How's what? Uh, how's your like typical day to day like? Typical day? Uh, I wake up at six in the morning, not because I want to, because I have to get my kids up and send them to school. <laughs> um, then when they're gone uh, on the school bus, it's 7 a.m. So I'm like, it's, it's too early, but I don't think I can go back to sleep again. So I'll just start working. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so usually morning time is actually the most productive. Uh, then there's no fixed schedule. So most of the time, if I feel like working on something, I'll work on it. Uh, so, which is the, the good thing about being indie is I don't have like very fixed schedule. Usually I can decide, decide ahead of time if I'm like for the next week, I'm just gonna work on this like sprint or a project. Uh, so I can switch between like in the zone mode versus sort of like slacking mode. Um, if I'm in the zone, I would work maybe 10 hours a day straight for a whole week, two week until I ship something. But after that, I'm like, okay, I need to reward myself. I'll just take it slow, maybe work only three to four hours a day and take the half day off, go out, go outside, do some of the interesting things. Yeah. So, but a very, the most typical day is just me sitting in front of a computer all day. Nothing special. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how does Vue get other uh, packages, library providers to support the whole Vue ecosystem, like Leaflet? Uh, don't even feel. Like, like what other libraries? Uh, Leaflet. Leaflet. Um, yeah. um, I guess we never asked them to. So the interesting thing is um, once you get reasonably big, you cross a certain threshold, you become sort of the like the one of the standard things to support for any front end solution. So like if you have a front end framework agnostic solution, basically you would have to say, I need to support React, I need to support Vue, I need to maybe support Angular, uh, maybe support Svelte, right? Uh, but React and Vue is basically like if you, because for them, React and Vue are the two easiest way to get their initial adoption. So it just becomes a sort of a, industry standard of some sort. Uh, let's have time for one more question from the audience. Uh, okay, you please. Yeah, yes. um, I'm wondering like, what are the motivations behind like moving to Singapore? Like just uh, if it's not like too personal, yeah. Um, so one, so there are a few reasons. Uh, the first is um, COVID. I was uh, living in New Jersey and because of COVID, we were not being able to go anywhere. And I live in a suburban area and so boring. And I was, because I was from Wuxi in China. I went to high school in Shanghai. My wife is from Shanghai. So we were used to the big city life and being locked in suburban house for two years. We kind of, we kind of got fed up. And although U.S. was opening up, <laughs> People were basically saying, okay, like, we'll just not wear masks. Uh, so we're like, okay, they don't wear masks. Well, I don't want to go outside. So at least like Singapore still requires wearing masks in indoors. So uh, it feels safer. Well, that's, that's only one of the reasons. Uh, the bigger reason is um, I want my child to grow up in a more, uh, in, a, in, a, in a culture where the West and East kind of mix together really well. Um, 
I saw some of my older relatives, kids growing up in the U.S., and uh, they got completely Americanized. Uh, for me personally, I, I feel like I don't want my kids to be completely Americanized, can't even speak Chinese. Um, so that's one of the reasons I moved here, because uh, they can get more connection to the Asian culture. They can also still maintain an international vision about things. Uh, so I think it's just a good environment for them to, to grow up in. Thanks, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, and, and for me personally, I kind of want to go back to the big city life. So since I've came here, I've, you know, I've been able to come here to meet you guys. I've been able to go to a UFC event. I'm going to the F1 event. I'm going to J. Charles concert. So I can't do that in New Jersey. So, yeah. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you for your questions. Uh, thank, thank you, Evan. Also. Thank you. Before we break out to our uh, hangout session, uh, where you can approach Evan and ask him more questions if you have, uh, we would like to thank our sponsors for today's event. So first off, JetBrains for sponsoring the food and beverages. Uh, we actually prepared like uh, bubble tea for everyone here. So you guys can go out and take some uh, after this. And then the hang uh, and US Enterprise for providing this location uh, for, for us to hold our event. And also just uh, to plug a bit, um, we are recruiting in the core team. So if you want to be part of like spreading hacker culture in NUS and also organizing these kind of events, uh, we've opened our recruitment. Please scan this QR code to take a look at uh, what it means to be a core team member. Stay updated with us through our Telegram channels. And yeah, that's all. So uh, please go out and get some bubble tea. There's still some pizza left. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>